let's go ahead and start uh, the June 2nd, 2021 meeting of the Montpelier Roxbury Board of School Directors. Uh, I mean, it starts at 6.32. Uh, let's do roll. Um, Kristen. Here. Yeah. Here. And again. Here. Andrew. Here. Amanda. Here. We have a quorum, right? We're missing Jerry, Jill, and Emma. I think we do have a quorum. Jerry was just in our finance committee meeting, so. She might just be running to do something. We do currently have a quorum, Jim. All right, that's what I thought. Um, all right, uh, public comment. Um, Again, if you could, Tina wants to go. Um, <clears throat> otherwise, if you hit the participant screen, um, you can raise your hand in uh, the participant screen and I will see you. Otherwise, you can just do what Tina did and raise your physical hand. Uh, and I don't see anyone else with their hand raised, so why don't um, Tina? Uh, floor is yours, and please uh, introduce yourself. And there's Jerry. Okay, Jerry, you want to just say your name for a roll quickly? Present. Great, thanks. Um, all right, go, Tina. I am Tina Muncy, and I'm here just to ask I don't see it anywhere on the agenda the discussion about Roxbury. Now, you said after budget, after retreat. And so I'm curious, when might I see it appear? Uh, hopefully soon, but thank you. Um, any other, any other <laughs> questions? Uh, it, it's, it, is, it is definitely on our, our to consider list, um, but we're, we're processing a lot. Um, so I'm happy to, happy to talk offline. Um, Anyone else? No, great. Um, Jim, Nathan has his hand up. Oh, Nathan, yes. I just, uh, I'm, I'm here tonight to, uh, in support of and to be an audience for the uh, high school track and field immersion class uh, populated by students who are running track this year and two of whom were part of the middle school program when I was there. and. I want to applaud them and all the work they've done leading up to this meeting. And as ever, thanks to all the board members for all the work you do. Great, thank you, Nathan. And I'm going to step out of turn and just give you and all the um, people who made a great track and all of our people who made a great athletic season possible, all the, all the coaches and volunteers and parents, um, who in the toughest of years gave our kids a great opportunity to go out and have some healthy competition and friendship and camaraderie and exercise. And uh, I know it was a ton of work and it was more work than usual. So thank you to, to you and everyone else who, who made that possible. Um, so next on the item, sorry, I printed out the equity agenda is the consent agenda. Um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Um, I I move to approve, but I'd like to pull the idea B um, for discussion just because I'd love some clarification on what it is. But I move to approve everything but the idea B. Okay. I second. Um, any discussion? Just really briefly, we had a, a really positive uh, financial report from Grant before this. And um, we're, because of our fund balance, we'll be fine, but it's, it's, a, it's a wild budget year and um, we, we may end up with a little more surplus. We may end up with a little deficit this year, but all in all, we're, we're in a good place. So thanks to Grant and Libby and all the administrators for, uh, for you know, minding the 
the, the public the public coffers as while navigating this really difficult situation and and having the money to spend it when we needed it on really important upgrades and provisions and um, services. So thank you very much. Excellent. Here, here. Um, any other discussion? Uh, let's proceed with the vote then. Uh, Kristen. Aye. Mia. Aye. Anika. Aye. Amanda. Yeah. Jerry. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Great, uh, consent agenda passes. Uh, and then you had a question, Mia, about the idea of B assurances. Yes, I just couldn't, I read it and I just still couldn't really understand what it is. <laughs> so I just would love a, just a summary before I feel comfortable voting to allow you to sign it, Jim. Okay. Yeah, idea B, B is our, um, is the federal grant money coming for special education. So IDEA is the uh, special education law. Um, and so with all of the federal grants that come, there are a list of assurances that need to be typically to check off quite honestly an electronic signature from me with the special education funds. I think it's just a, it's a slightly different thing that, that goes to the board chair for whatever reason. I'm not sure why that one goes to the board chair and all the rest of them I have to do. Um, but special education certainly has its own rules to it. So it's just grant, it's grant money and the assurances come from, you know, we won't, that, that Jim is assuring that the money is used on with kids with special education needs that, you know, that kind of thing. It's, it's literally what the word means there with assurances. There's a whole laundry list of them. Okay, thank you. Great. Any other uh, questions about IDB? Uh, motion to approve uh, authorization for the board chair to sign the IDB insur assurances. Uh, I'll move. Second. 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 Thank you. Uh, Kristen? Aye. Mia? Aye. Annika? Aye. Uh, Jerry? Aye. Amanda? Aye. I have it. Um, and now I'm, uh, we are. Um, you skipped me, Jim, but that's okay. I, 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 I thought so. Sorry. I thought so. You got, you I, just got did, I was like, maybe I missed it. Well, yeah, I, yeah, I still have it, Andrew, but you want to you pile on? We're, we're good. We're good. We can move Great. forward. I'm just, I'm Thanks. Just Sorry about that. Um, now, very excited and pleased to uh, have another student presentation. Um, on uh, track upgrade, uh, and I'm, I think I, I definitely see Meg and Ben. Um, I don't know if Ezra is here as well. Maybe it's Andrew Beth's um, uh, Zoom. But uh, let me turn it over to you guys. I do have to. I have to duck off at seven for about half an hour to forty-five minutes to attend to a kid thing, and Andrew will be ably. Uh, taking the reins, um, but hopefully I'm able to see um, all of all or most of this presentation. So, um, hey. Ben and Ezra, uh, go ahead. So I, I'll just introduce them. Um, thanks, Jim, and we will have the presentation. It's on a website that the kids have created, so you can actually watch it at a later date, and we can share it out if people are interested. Um, I'm Beth Merrill. I'm a parent of uh, two kids in this district, and I also um, am the library assistant at the high school this year, which has been really a great, great place to be. Um, I was really hoping to get kids in school more. So um, when they opened up enrichment classes um, for kids to be able to be at Montpelier High School twice a day instead of just once, um, I volunteered to get this group together and just look at um, the, the track facility that we have, the track program, and just, I just wanted them to kind of delve into um, this as a research project, as a, you know, a community building project. Um, so we have, we, we call it track enrichment. I think it's technically called covering ground. Um, 
we've been meeting this quarter, which started at the end of April, um, once or twice a week. Um, this enrichment has had them, you know, sitting a little bit in a classroom, but mostly um, doing some research, um, going out to the track and actually making actual improvements to the track um, in preparation for real, real life events. Um, and they've done a great job and they really just want to share with you what they've found about um, just, just the numbers of kids who are participating in track and other people who are um, involved in, in who benefit from, from MHS's track. Um, and so I'm gonna, we have a, a presentation. Is that Libby, would you be able to share it or I don't know if I'm able to- I have screen. enabled you all to share. So you, you yes. should be able to share your screen. Let me okay. know if you can't. Okay, um, so they're gonna introduce themselves. Ezra is actually on his way back into service from being in Northfield. Um, so he should be here momentarily. Um, let me just- They're going to introduce themselves within the presentation. So, I'm going to mute myself, um, and I'll kind of know Meg and Ben when you want me to advance. But if you need me to go back or forward, just let me know. Okay, so this is um, our MHS track enrichment class. Um, I'm Ben Weatherill. Um, I do uh, the 400, uh, the sprinting relays, and long jump. And I started running track this year. Um, I'm Meg Vosian. Uh, I run track for two years. Um, uh, I'm a freshman. I run some of the dis distance events, like the 1500 and the 3K. And I also started throwing javelin, which has been pretty fun. Ezra's also been uh, in track for the two years that it's been offered, um, once in middle school and again this year. And he's a distance runner and a high jumper. So our goals for this presentation are to advocate for um, improvements to our track that would make it safer and just altogether better for everyone who uses it. Um, we'd also like to coordinate with other stakeholders in our district to organize our advocacy efforts. Um, and we are here to ask you, the school board, to consider a range of improvements to our track um, to accommodate for our growing track and field programs as pictured in this picture. Um, so, so far, um, we've had uh, meetings with Andrew LaRosa, um, our director of facilities here, um, to talk about what he's done so far to work on this project. Uh, we've met with Chris Levine, uh, the Harvard athletic director, because um, they just upgraded their dirt track and to see what they did. Um, we researched new equipment and the current state of our own track and um, what we need to uh, host and meets and other things. Uh, we've created this presentation and website to inform the public on, on the standpoint and where we are right now. Um, uh, we've assisted with preparations for the middle school track and field meet that happened at MHS on May 8th. And we helped to host uh, the, MS, the MSMS Invitational for 226 middle schoolers. Um, we did a line painting, we helped run events, and we did some finish line camera. And on in this the photo there is Meg helping paint the lines. So when I was in seventh grade, there was a the track club at MSMS was formed. It was a um, volunteer effort with we had eight volunteer coaches that were parents. Um, which provide transportation for us to get 232 because we didn't really have a space um, 
it was just harder for us to train um, at our track at that point. Um, before then, before 2019, when I was in seventh grade, there, there weren't any track programs at the middle school level. And there wasn't really options for girls in spring sports. You could do baseball, you could do ultimate frisbee, but they're male dominated and it really wasn't <laughs> like inviting. Um, but in 2019, we had a team or a club of 24 athletes, 20 of whom were girls, which was a pretty amazing effort. Um, and then of course, in the 2020 season, it was canceled due to COVID. Um, but this year we have 30 high schoolers and 50 middle schoolers in our programs, which is uh, quite the increase, it's pretty awesome. So now we'd like to share some of our major accomplishments from this year. Our track was used to host meets for the first time in 17 years. Um, this is a picture of some girls that I think are May 8th meet running the 100 or at the start of the 100. So, yeah. Um, this spring, because of COVID, um, lots of middle school teams around the state had few or no meets on their calendars. Um, and we decided to host some meets to give the athletes a chance to compete and just um, go out there and challenge themselves. On May 8th, the coaches at MSMS and volunteers hosted the first meet at our high school in 17 years. And then again, on May 24th, we had another meet um, hosting 10 teams in 200, 226 athletes and they competed at our M MHS Invitational. Um, this meet was put on because we had help from our neighboring towns. We had a high jump fit from Northfield, timing system and hurdles from Spalding and a starting gun from U32. So it really did, it took more than just our city. It's like saying it took a village. Um, we, at the meet, we had over 50 parent community and student volunteers which ran the meet. Um, they did everything from paint lines on the track to weeding around it and moved shot put tow boards and hand timed and measured all of the events. And it was really a pretty amazing effort put on by this group. Um, so we just have some photos of different events that were happening at that meet. Um, in the center there is some uh, is the hurdles. Um, in the right corner is long jump. Uh, bottom right is um, high jump, and uh, bottom left is some is a sprint sprinting event. Um, at the MSMS team, uh, they won both meets, uh, even when they were facing in the uh, second uh, meet, ten teams. Um, uh, winning is not a, a new thing at uh, M uh, MHS. Um, in the 1990s, um, we won, I think, six championships. Um, this tradition, we think, started to fade uh, when other sports gained popularity. Um, but given our recent numbers, uh, there has definitely been a resurgence in the track and field community. I think we just wanted to point out from these old yearbook photos, that is a, a pole vault in the top left quarter that we actually had pole vaulting at MHS in the past. Yeah, and then on the right, oh, never mind. Um. So the Montpelier Recreation Department um, is a program that helps generate interest uh, in the track and field program for kids between six and 14 years old. Um, it's been hosted at U, uh, MHS on our track for years, and it'd be great to get kids interested in track and field on a better track. So top right is like a photo taken in 1980, uh, 1987. And then the other ones are more recent. Actually, the bottom right one is some kids doing long jump too. So 
So our track is um, has many uses. Uh, we have many people that use it um, over the fall cross country running season. I believe U32 came and they used it because theirs is under construction. Um, grad outdoor graduations have been held uh, on the track, both the middle school and elementary ones in 2020, and then all of the high school ones have been on it. Um, teachers and state workers and any other people that want to walk on it during their lunch breaks can use it. Um, there's an all night fundraiser called Relay for Life hosted by the American Cancer Society that also has used utilized the track. Um, and then the Central Vermont Runners when they host the kids track meet among with other events is both is also on our track. And our district pie fall festival and one mile and 5k runs have weren't on the track too. Um, there are currently 272 members of the Central Vermont Runners, 50 of whom are under 19. Uh, the Central Vermont Runners has been hosting the kids track meet at Montpelier High School for over 20 years. Uh, years ago, um, they had over 200 kids competing in each track meet. Um, and just last year, they had their 40th anniversary of the Central Vermont Runners group. Um, they weren't able to celebrate with a track meet because of COVID, of course, um, and they didn't have get to have a track meet the year before either because no, there wasn't any track that was available to host it. Um, some potential users uh, of our track uh, could be Girls on the Run, um, which is a um, um, elementary school and middle school uh, running group. Um, in the past years, they've had uh, 700 plus kids. Um, uh, Unified Sports at MLPS co uh, community could use the track. Um, MHS and MS, MS could host, we could host more meets and that could also be an income generator. And it could be a community gathering spot for different groups of people who either work in and around town or come to run on it. Um, some current track issues that we have here at MHS um, is on the left-hand side, there's tire tracks, some people driving on it, like during graduations. Um, there are puddles uh, over our around our track, um, which can be solved by uh, better draining. And most of them are formed also by tire tracks. Um, and broken edging, which is on the far right. Um, this, is, this could be a tri tripping hazard for different people. Um, and just is dangerous overall. Um, and yeah, um, most of these problems could be stopped by not letting people drive on, drive on our track. Um, these numbers uh, were provided to us uh, by our director of facilities, Mr. LaRosa. Um, they are rough estimates of facilities improvement costs. Um, there's uh, fixing our curb, our wood curb around the track, which is a safety concern. Um, material like the surface of the track and grading, uh, paved long jump, high jump, and pole vault run-ups. Ours are currently pretty cracked. Um, there's discus throwing pad and backstop, throw put showing pad, throwing pad pit and backstop and this bullet is um, a permanent fence that would prevent uh, runners or athletes or anyone from getting hit by lacrosse or other balls um, and the last one is engineering permits and stuff and it comes to a total of about sixty three thousand to one hundred ten thousand dollars and these could be ongoing improvements I just want to thank Mr. LaRosa, who's here at this meeting for um, really helping so much with this enrichment and coming in and talking to us um, almost on a weekly basis about 
um, just ideas that he's already looked into and um, just coordinating with us. It's been really great. I think Ezra may be signed on. Ezra, are you able to talk about the field equipment that we're looking at? Um, ben, can you can you see the notes? I can do it. Yeah. Um, so so this is a list of different field equipment costs that would be um, basically needed to run a track program at MHS and MSMS. Um, so the first one is high jump pit um, and the standards um, for high jump um, so that we can have a high jump here. Um, the second thing uh, would be hurdles. Uh, currently, we have 12 hurdles. Um, and you need about 50 or 60 for a meet. Um, also, a better long jump runway. Right now, ours is, is cracked asphalt and is not the best for anyone to run on. Uh, and well, another useful thing would be pole vault. Um, so that we could practice that and add that to our list of things we can do at meets. This here's Ben. Oh, um, so another option for our track could be um, to completely replace it with a synthetic track. Um, this would cost around 1.2 to $1.5 million. Um, we believe that Montpelier taxpayers uh, would support a bond or budget increase to finance this endeavor. And on the right there is a picture of U32's track in East Montpelier, which is synthetic. So, um in conclusion, where do we go from here? We have options, of course, we have improvements that we could do to our own track, as, men as we have mentioned. Um, and then of course, the new synthetic track option. Um, we ask you, the school board and superintendent to consider building a new track to support the sustained and growing interest of running in track and field in Central Vermont and to purchase the equipment necessary to offer our track and field programs, um, like to offer it as a school support that is sufficient. Um, we ask you to consider to change your policies to protect our facilities. Um, for example, no driving on our track um, and make short-term improvements to our track if a new synthetic track is not possible. Um, we have begun to put information on this website um, as well. So feel free to take a look at your convenience. We hope this presentation has given you a glimpse of what's possible for the MHS track and field improvements to the physical space will benefit many students at MRPS um, as well as community members, young and old. We're wondering how we might continue to support the board and the, our administration in moving these changes forward so that we might see improvements in the near future. Um, we're happy to gather letters or support or petitions to do further research to help determine what's feasible for the MHS track. Thank you for your time. Thank you, everyone. That was really, really helpful. Um, we really appreciate the time and energy you put into this. And it's it's really empowering to see students driving an initiative of this nature and also in the face of such unprecedented adversity this past year, uh, organize these important events. Like it's, it's, it's not really social distancing in this regard, you physical distance, but you guys came together as a group of runners and that's really empowering and exciting to see. So kudos to you all. I wanna open it up to the board for questions. I see Mia, you have your hand up. 
Um, I first wanted to say thank you for all that information. It was so very helpful to have that all presented um, in such a such a clear way and for us to see some real numbers, especially. Uh, so I wanted to first say thanks to, for that because I know that research uh, is a lot is a lot of work. Um, and yeah, job well done. Um, I also wanted to say you're bringing me right back because I also I ran track in high school myself. Uh, I ran the 800 and uh, those pictures are definitely bringing back a lot of really great memories and maybe just a touch of uh, performance anxiety. <laughs> um, so thank you for that. And my question is um, around this being available as uh, as a community resource, in addition to something that our schools use, I wonder if there was any consideration that you've made yet to um, other kinds of fundraising, um, seeing that there's the Central Vermont Runners, that this is something that the whole town and, and neighboring towns could be taking, um, taking advantage of, if there are other um, any other funding resources that you've considered yet or would be would be open to considering? I think that we, um, well, just speaking for the students um, and just kind of going on uh, Mr. LaRosa's suggestion, you know, we looked at what, you know, what are the issues right now with the track and what, what are the goals um, and didn't focus so much on, um, on the funding um, because we're not necessarily that well versed in that. I mean, we do feel like there would be, you know, this is an asset to the whole city of Montpelier. Um, at the same time, it's like a resource that our school district really, feel, I feel like we really need to get this up to speed to be able to accommodate the 80 kids who are um, participating, you know, in spring and the middle school program just keeps growing. Um, so, I mean, I think we'd be open to it, but that ne wasn't necessarily the focus of our, of our, of our course. All right, thank you. Jerry. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. It was awesome. Um, question, you said uh, some of the items you listed were um, revenue generators. Do you have any numbers behind that or even ballpark figures? Um, I would call on our middle school coach, Nathan, who uh, has brought that up as a, a when, when you host meets, you're able to charge meat fees. Um, I mean, honestly, if we had been able to sell food at the last meet with the 226 kids and their families, um, we might've gotten a down payment for the track, but Nathan, do you wanna say something more? I think that's the right idea. I don't, um, I don't have hard numbers in, sorry about traffic noise. I'm enjoying the outside. Um, you know, if we build if we build a track that's a contemporary, good resource, we can host invitationals and we can also host championship meets, uh, and those can you know you can do you do two hundred fifty dollars a team to attend, or you can do a per kid, um, you know, and I think it's worth talking about access and equity and things like that. And we we want to be inclusive, and the, the meets we held this year, we didn't charge anything because we just felt like it's a service to the to the uh, the young runners of Vermont to to be able to compete at all, um, but as we get more competent at that, and if we have a, a facility that's really uh, top notch or or at the very least um, contemporary, then I think it's reasonable to charge those fees. And it's probably you know it's probably not enough to fund a, fund a bond, but it uh, it would probably go to defray a lot of the direct costs of the program in any given season. Uh, and then you know it's a um, like, let's see, like a gymnasium, right? It's a it's a resource that can be used by lots and lots of different entities. Um, you know, I was just looking at the the I think it's the warrants. I can't remember one of the one of the board documents for today. You know, talks about rental fees for the district, which are not a thing this year because of COVID. But it but the district does 
make money, make revenue in other years based on rental fees. And so um, it's a little bit, a little bit, if you build it, they will come uh, model. Uh, but again, I, I, I don't want to overpromise. It's not, it's not going to fund a uh, debt service on a bond, but it would, uh, it would certainly, I think, carry its own weight uh, in other ways. Okay, thank you. I, I did get a call today by a community member in Roxbury saying um, they support uh, doing something about the field. So. All right, thank you. Annika. Thanks, Andrew. And thanks uh, for the wonderful presentation. Um, it's just something that, that definitely we need to, we need to look at. Um, and this, my question is more, I guess, for Andrew. I'm just curious, what are the maintenance costs for currently, what, what we have in terms of track and whatnot? And then um, I guess if we have, if we upgrade the track and, and add these programs, does anyone have ballpark numbers of what maintenance costs would be um, maintenance and maybe, you know, other costs associated with um, um, having these programs? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the answer to that is, I don't have those numbers, but as we transition from letting, from having the rec department take care of our fields to us taking on, on in-house with our own maintenance people, our own field grounds and fields uh, personnel and our own equipment, we'll be in a much better position to just to be able to do it and fold it into our normal routines. Uh, you know, we, we felt bad this year when these track meets came up that the, the track wasn't in better condition for them, but we weren't positioned to do it. We didn't know they were happening until a couple of weeks before. So, so the help of the community was really fab, quite fabulous. Um, but I think that, that the maintenance and on, on, ongoing care of it is certainly would fall easily within the realm of our expectation of what we would be doing um, with the rest of the fields. Um, you know, that 20 year, and I, I want to kind of go on a, a little bit of an aside here, that that 20 year mark, that 17 mark, year mark is really, as I go back and look at the history, I, I want to, you know, it was about that time that, that we started to let our athletic facilities down a little bit. You know, when the track program left and the football program started to, to, to lessen, that's when it seems we started to say, okay, you can do touch a truck on the track. And we started to say, okay, you can use the park, you can use the practice soccer field for overflow parking for Circus Smirkus. We can drive over the softball field. We can do all kinds of things that would never ever happen in any other school district. And I think that um, we now are in a position to really make some solid improvements to, to our fields. And that was one of the things that when we originally talked, I originally talked with Beth and the students was, you know, the, the, unless we do a paved track right away, we, know, we need to still invest in our facilities. There is safety concerns that we need to deal with. It is a, it is a fundamental piece of the campus that needs to be taken care of. And um, we, are, we are in a position to do that. I'm gonna be putting that in, in, the, in the budget as it comes forward. Uh, I'm gonna break out athletic facilities so we have a better, clear, better and clearer idea of how much money we're actually putting into pure athletic, athletic programs, facilities wise versus just grounds. Uh, so that'll be coming up. Um, so I, 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 I really think that the track, if you look at the track and we talk a lot about it, people look at the edging and go, oh, you know, it's falling apart. Well, if you look at the traffic pattern, sadly, that's where the that's where the, the edging broke down is where cars clipped it and the where where it's flat and level and square that's that was built in 1973 so we do have to change the habits around our campus and how we use it and it's we're breaking habits that are you know some of them are 50 years old but we're getting there um you know as far as i know no one's driven over the softball field this year so um, that's uh, that we we got to feel good about that <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Very helpful. Emma? Um, yeah, I just want to echo what everybody's saying about thanking um, 
the youth athletes that are here tonight. Um, you guys have put an incredible amount of work and thought into this. And I think um, if you <laughs> put a bond forward and spoke the way that you did tonight to your um, community members, I think they would definitely vote to approve that bond. So I'm not sure. Um, I just wanted to say quickly, like, I think public schools are, are at the heart of every community. And I think we have really strong public schools academically. And I think we can, I like what Andrew said about sort of we're in a position now to maybe start looking at how else can we strengthen our school communities. And um, I never played youth sports growing up, but I've been able to see it through the lens of a parent and community member. And I think I've seen all of you as athletes um, growing up. And it's really cool to watch you all succeed in your individual sports. And I think that um, brings the community together. You know, I was at the school tonight for a baseball game. There was a ton of people surrounding the tennis courts, watching people play tennis. There was a lacrosse um, practice with a bunch of community members. There's people that come down to the baseball games that aren't even parents of the kids, you know, just community members that love baseball and want to watch it. And I know, you know, younger kids look up to the older kids. My daughter does gymnastics and word on the street. I think Ezra, are you the only guy on the gymnastics team? I am, yeah. So you've got notoriety, people look up to you, the community follows you guys as athletes and it brings us all together. Um, so I'm 100% supportive of, you know, if we're in a financial position in this town to invest some money into our facility facilities, I would like to see that happen. Um, my question is in terms of, maybe this is for Andrew or Libby or, um, but in terms of like a bond, if we wanted to get something kickstarted for facilities, would it be, um, would that be a bond that the school board puts forward or would that be something that the citizen, like a citizen initiative bond? It'd be a school board piece. Um, Andrew and I weren't here when the, uh, when the last bond was created. So we'd have a lot of learning to do about how to do that, I think, to help yeah. get the school board through it. But the other piece is, is that you know, we are looking at, we're getting considerable money for SR3. And while we can't use SR3 on a track, it we can use our capital fund on a track. So it may not be a need for a bond, um, or there may be, you know, it, the, we have lots of, we would have lots of decisions to make around how to fund such a project um, that certainly Andrew Grant and I have talked at length about. Um, but if, we can't use the federal funding coming in for this for something like this, but we can use the federal funding for projects that we are already planning to use for our capital fund, like window renovation and replacement. So there are ways to use buckets that are coming that may not require a bond. Maybe it does. Maybe I'm, I'm totally speaking out of turn because we haven't done a huge amount of research on, on it yet, but um, yeah. we are talking about all of those options. So yeah, I'm I'm really supportive. I mean, I don't really want to I, I don't want to have to like move things around. Like I think use ESSER funding for what we want to use ESSER funding for and then make sure we have funding available for these types of things. When the, um, when the baseball team came to talk about their field, I had requested a little bit of information about like prior spending. So Andrew, I'm really interested in that, you know, like what has our historical spending been on what sports? Um, and I just think we need to like sort of create a long term vision for, you know, when do we spend money and and be equitable. But all in all, I just think, you know, when parents and community members are able to go to art shows and theater productions and track meets and, you know, baseball games like that strengthens our community. So I'm 100 percent supportive. And thank you for coming tonight. Yeah. And, and in terms of process here emma and and then i'm gonna i'm gonna get to amanda and mia but i just wanted to respond to to that particular notion we did create this facilities committee which hasn't really had the bandwidth to meet yet and i was thinking before this i was emailing with anna and some other community members about the end of the msms building committee and the creation of this facilities committee I think this is a great issue to refer to the facilities committee. And I think we need to get a facilities committee meeting on the calendar in the next month or so here. And I think this should be one of the first issues that we talk about in light of the capital plan 
I think we need to flush out the charge. But when we talked about it before and I wrote down what everybody said, I think that'll be pretty easy for us to do. And then I think this could be, you know, the one of the first big issues that we talk about in the context of the capital plan. And obviously Andrew LaRosa would be there and Libby and that committee. And then we could we could make some progress on that heading into the fall. I don't know what people think about that, but I, I wanted to propose that. Andrew? Well, one of the things that, that Matt Link, the athletic director and I are working on is we're, we're going to create, we're going to fold in a athletic fields section into the facilities report where we look at not only just the fields themselves, their usage, um, their care, their maintenance, their uh, a sort of a five-year plan for their improvement, as well as to the best of our ability, uh, Matt's ability to track where athletes are. So when we so we can see groups coming up before they get to the high school, we can see where the trends are. So we can so we can adjust and we can make sure that we are we're prepared that oh we're going to have and and it's in a small school it's tough because you know you get a group of friends and say hey let's go do it and suddenly your your team is, your team is doubled in size so but uh, it's better to, it's I think it's uh, it's going to be better that we at least are making an effort to sort of track this this. Um, moving forward. So that that Matt Link and I have been starting to coordinate on that. And that would be part of our next facilities. I, I, I could imagine someday it separates off into its own piece because there's so much there, but it's a start. And Matt Link for those for our newer board members is our director of athletics, just in case you haven't met Matt yet. So I'm going to go to Amanda because she hasn't spoken yet. And then I'm going to go to Ezra and then I'm going to go to Mia if that works for everyone. Thank you so much for bringing this to our attention, for doing all the work that you did. Um, I'm really amazed and I'm really happy. And thank you, Beth, for working on this too. Uh, and Nathan, for all your work. I, um, I, I dream of the time where we can have these conversations and also include um, thinking about wheelchair accessibility, um, you know, there's many, many in our country, many uh, rural, run and roll competitions. Um, and th there are so many ways that we can think um, to include um, our, our students and our families that are uh, in wheelchairs or that have other disabilities that, um, that we can include in these conversations. I think it's really important to make sure that we are, like when we're thinking of equipment, what are the things so that, you know, eventually long-term plan of like really thinking, um, with sports, I know that there, there, uh, there were, um, was it called, was it called inclusive as, as sports? Unified, unified sports. Unified sports that um, was at the elementary school that, that hasn't happened um, last year, it didn't happen this year, obviously, but um, so just like to think about when we're thinking of any programs around exercise and around, you know, this freedom that we do include our communities that have other types of fun that can be included in like the track. Uh, I know that we, when we did um, the when when I we didn't do it, but when when the our district did uh, uh, the race against racism a couple of years ago, that was like a conversation that we were having. So I really hope that um, when we're thinking about this plan that we also think about that and I you know I support I um I'm a wannabe runner that doesn't run but I dream of running in my head every day <laughs> so I you know support you all hopefully I'll get excited to run you're a very fast walker though <laughs> thanks <laughs> maybe maybe if there's a new track you can run on that Amanda that'll be inspiring maybe I did sign up for a 300 mile challenge in 2021 and I have done 1.5 miles this year. So I still, I don't know how I'm gonna make it, but I will. <laughs> and, so. and just be, before we move on to Ezra, Andrew, do you wanna address um, ADA accessibility when it comes to these types of projects? Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, there would be, a, there would be an absolute baseline fundamental uh, accessibility that would be expected in any public project with regards to 
adaptive sports and things like that, it would be a great opportunity to, to, to folk to speak with the folks at Vermont Adaptive and you know what are what are the facilities and and it's really in working in projects similar to this, it's uh, it's the little things and I'm, I, I don't know what they are, but it's it's a, the right bench in the right location, the right storage unit in the right location. You know, it's those little, it's that sort of, like I say, I think most accessibility, fundamental ADA accessibilities, you know, 99% of those are covered just as a matter of is good design and, and we capture them. It's that last one or 2% that makes the difference. Um, and we absolutely if there was a serious consideration of moving forward with this, and that's one of those things that that number, that 1.2 to 1.5, you know, as any of you, I don't know how many of you were involved in the last bond boat or have been involved in bond boats, they, they roll up because you're not going to just do the track and without doing the lights because you're going to have the trucks out there digging it up. So you're going to run, make sure your power's up to dig because those poles were put in in 73. So you're going to put in metal poles with LED lights. Well, are we all tired of the porta potties out there? Yeah, we're probably, probably pretty tired of the, pretty, the porta potties out there. Concessions, what do you need to do concessions wise? Um, and then once you start serving, serving press food, box, Andrew, press box. You got to bring in Matt Lang's press box. <laughs> well, I, we, I want to fill this, I want to fill the seats first. Um, you know, the, 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 the concession stand, you know, yeah, it'd be great to have a concession stand. Well, then you get the Department of Health involved and then you get lots of stainless steel hoods and things involved in fire suppression. So it, it's, um, it, it, it needs to be discussed because if it was so easy as to just say, well, let's just redo a track, um, that's the easy part. The track is the easy part. That's the 1.2. That we know. It's all the others that go along with it that we don't know quite yet. Um, but but we, we, do need, we do need to make a yearly investment. Thanks for that, Andrew. Ezra? Hi everyone, sorry I'm so late. Um, I just wanted to say that like the whole enrichment group is more than willing to do anything we can to make this process any faster. Cause I think we all really wanna have a track, you know, like when we're in high school and I know the U32 track took a few years to build and there was delays. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say that like, we're all really willing to do whatever we can to make it go by faster. Thanks so much, Ezra. Yeah, I think sending along this presentation to everybody in an email would be really helpful. And I think you guys, have kicked off a really, a really valuable conversation here. Mia? Yeah, um, totally agree with that. And Andrew, I was going to, um, yeah, suggest that we get the facilities committee on this right away, largely because as Angela Rosa just pointed out, it really isn't just, should we improve the track? There's a, a lot more that's wrapped up in it. And it feels like the facilities committee is the place to be um, uh, looking at this holistically with all of the buildings and grounds and facilities of the district in mind. Because um, if we were to decide to go to bond, it would probably also include some of our buildings, but, you know, but I don't, improvements to our buildings. Um, and, you know, I don't know that for sure, but I'm guessing. Um, and it also seems like the facilities committee is the place to do the research on not just what are we going to do to hit the baseline requirements for um, ADA, but how do we incorporate adaptive sports and, you know, can, can we and should we put our focus and our resources toward that and, and that kind of thing. So, and as, as the facilities committee is thinking about this, there's a couple of sort of plugs I'd like to make. One, I would love to invite students to be a part of that committee if possible um, to help in, in, in as the discussion con, um, continues. I think that would be really, really valuable. And, um, and I would like for part of the discussion to be, uh, are there other funding sources we could consider knowing that this is really a community resource, um, including like, local business sponsorships or, you know, whatever. I just would like that to be part of the conversation. Obviously, that's not a decision we're going to make today, but I really would like to have that seriously considered um, as we are also considering using taxpayer money for these things. Um, so those are some of the um, points I, I wanted to just put out there to be part of the conversation. And then I do have two follow-up questions. One is to the students. Um, this might have been in the presentation and I might have missed it, but do you have maybe an order of priority um, 
of the you know for spending the money uh, or or the th the improvements that that you need and if if it's in the presentation and you're emailing it to us great that'll be very helpful for us to refer back to but if it's not i think i would just be requesting that maybe that could be a follow up conversation that you all could have and then send it to us um to help give us you know from your perspective here's what i would tackle first and then second and then um and then third um so not to put any of you on the spot to, to name that right now, but that's just a request that I'm making. And then the one thing that it felt like we could do immediately and probably should is changing the use of these so that there's people, nobody's driving on the track anymore, et cetera. But I'm not, I, I just have a question around whether or not that is a board, the board makes that call or if that is an administrative call. It's like, if there's a policy that we need to change, then we should do that, or if it's actually procedures that need to be adjusted. So that maybe that's a question for Libby. Yeah, there's nothing in policy around that. I think it, the decision was just made that you know parking was an issue for a certain yeah. event, and that people people started. I mean, people now park on our pro, on our property on MHS at the track without even talking to us about it for weekend events, like, like on the track. Yeah. 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 That that's more. And I, and and those of you, I've, I've only been in Montpelier for twenty plus years, so I'm a newcomer. So, um, I'll tell you how you really so feel. I, I think Just really that. I think that really was part of that twenty years ago when the schools and the city were one, more or less one, and the, there was a, a you know, boy, parking's getting tough for Fourth of July. Well, let's use the high school softball field. Um, boy, we'd like yeah. to have. We'd like to do touch a truck. Well, we're not going to drive trucks out onto the rec field out on Elm Street, and we're not going to put them down at Dog River. Let's drive them around. The, let's put them at the high school. So I think it's sort of just evolved over time. So it's sort of been expected. Tom Allen actually had a conversation. The head of the head of the service with someone, a woman who was pulling up onto the grass, and he said, "We're not parking." And she said, "Why not?" It's like <laughs> because it's a field. <laughs> it's not. Mm -hmm. It's not parking. Uh, so it's it's really been habit, and and it's going to be quite honestly. There's going to be some tough conversations in the coming year as we come back to normal, when the city, farmers, the the Thanksgiving farmers market, the Fourth of July, uh, touch a truck, circus Marcus, and 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 we're in a small town, and and we're trying to get away from driving a mile across town to park to watch fireworks. And I know that's I know that's more out of towners, but that's going to be a hard conversation that we're going to have with the city as as we go forward. If we're serious about this. I mean, I want people to look at how open our campus is. And it's, it's one of the fabulous things about our campus. It's so open. Yeah. But go to any other athletic, go to any high school, middle school you go to over the next couple of months, and you will see there's absolutely no way anybody, whether it's a fence, whether it's boulders, whether it's whether there is no way that you're going to, no matter the, how modest the field is, you'll notice that there is a clear indication to the community. We don't, we don't use these for anything other than athletics. Yeah. Or related field, the related type activities. Yeah, so, I guess I'm wondering, is there something you need from the board in order to start that shift? Or is that something that you No, I think that comes from support, right? So that yeah. would be it. That would be a, a, a piece that we a call we would make that we would yep. not be allowing to do it. And, and I would venture to bet that the board would hear um, critique. Mm -hmm of that decision, although we didn't hear much from the mudlot and we expected the mudlot to have more critique from the community than it, we didn't get any, I don't believe Andrew, at least I didn't. Um, so, so, but I would make a bet that, that that's the board would, and that would just be supportive, uh, you know, yep. support of the decision that's made. Um, but yeah, Andrew and I are both in agreement that we need to figure out how to, how to stop the, the parking on our facilities and or, uh, unless it's a place that's meant to be parked on, of course. Right. Right. <laughs> but, okay. But uh, the track and because it it does mess it up and it does cause significant safety hazards that we then have to fix before our, our soccer players can compete on it. Or you know. Yep. Yeah. Be before we we move forward with these last uh, couple of hands, is there are there any board members that do not support protecting? the track from people driving on it and parking on it. Because I wanna give our administration our unequivocal support here so that they can move forward. And if we get a bunch of angry emails or calls 
it's on us to back them up. So I just want to ask that question. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, everyone. On um, be, also before we move forward, in terms, I just want to respond to two things from Mia because they pertain to that facilities committee. In terms of scheduling a facilities committee, uh, Anna, would you be able to help us with a doodle poll? Um, it's Kristen, Jill, Andrew LaRosa, and I believe Libby, if I'm not mistaken, who, who are on that committee initially. And in terms of involving students, the initial plan, one of the bullet points pertain to the earth group and pertain to the the district's energy use and involving that student group. So I think expanding that because we can clearly see that you know, our facilities have many impacts on students beyond just their interest in energy and climate change. So I think we can use something more general and we can in, involve a bunch of different student groups uh, when we're looking at issues. So when we're looking at this issue, for example, in involving this group, and I'm sure there are other student groups, student athletic groups that would like to weigh in. So does, does that seem reasonable, Mia? For sure. Okay, um, I'm just looking here, Amanda. Oh, sorry, old hand. Old hand, Emma. Um, something that Andrew said about I, it reminded me. This is just like quick commentary about broken windows theory and policing. I don't know if any of you have heard of that, but it's like basically in neighborhoods where there's already broken windows and sort of things are broken down, then people sort of take liberties to feel like they can continue to trash <laughs> that neighborhood. So I feel like when our facilities send a signal like, well, you know, this is no U32 fancy, you know, brand new track, we can park on that. You know, so I think it's, I think it will be like a little bit of us leading by showing our investment in the property to signal to the community too, that no, these are nice new facilities. You're not allowed to use them that way. Um, and then the other thing, which is sort of piggyback on Mia, around like priorities. I was also interested in that. Um, I was wondering, you know, something that Ezra said about wanting to have something tangible before he graduates and before Meg and Ben graduate. Um, you know, they call it slow democracy for a reason. It usually takes a while to get stuff like a bond through and then construction planning and all of that. So I was involved with the playground thing at Union Elementary School and none of our kids ended up getting to play on the new playground. But it's a great community resource and I'm, you know, like that's, we've got to start somewhere. But I wonder if priority wise, if there's anything, you know, that you could make use of next season, like maybe the hurdles or something like that, that we could pay for out of fund balance, um, you know, just quicker, maybe cheaper, easier things to get. Um, that would be something you might want to consider in your email to us. I just so not to and and actually Meg Meg absolutely do that for me now that people are actually running on that track the edging is the number one priority and it is going to be if you know when it was just sort of deteriorating and and we were taking over it was like all right we'll go out and spend a couple thousand and we'll transition edges and whatever but if we got kids out there really running we need to have that reconstructed properly. And that is not going to be something that we're going to be able to just sort of take from other places. Like we're going to need to, if this track program is going to continue on that cinder track, we're going to need to, we very well may need to do that to say, it's going to cost us thirty, forty thousand $40,000 to clean this up and get, make it safe, whether it's for one year or five years or however long. Um, but that would, for me, now Meg's, That that sounds that sounds reasonable, Andrew. Yeah, I think I think we should we should do a deeper dive on this with the facilities committee and get back to this later in the summer if if that works. It's not like Andrew, what is the soonest that we could get those corners dealt with? Well, I don't think we're gonna be I, ideally we would have them. So okay, so we've got a budget already passed for next year, right? So that mm -hmm. money's gonna have to come from somewhere. If we right. wanted to have it prepared for the spring, for the spring meet, 
um, for the, you know, for, for next spring season. Um, so, um, if the funding, if I knew where the funding was coming from, we could put it out the bid and maybe tackle it at the end of the, you know, maybe catch a window between the end of the soccer season and the snow flying, or at least have people lined up to do it right when the snow melts and, and, you know, maybe there's some, there's some grass seed out there and some, um, um, you know, uh, straw out on some grass that's waiting to get, be, um, be mowed. If that funding doesn't come, well, then we'll have to build it into next year's budget. And then, so, so that would be the next year. Am I got my fiscal years correct? Yeah. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves though. I think, yeah. We, yeah, yeah. Some, I think we need to be looking at that, the, the field and the track and all the, the campus in general. And we need to really think what, what's the vision here? Um, because I don't think any taxpayer wants us to pay $40,000 to pay up the edging and then tear that up the next year to put a synthetic track down. So I think we, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves and, and we need to think, think about what it is that, that we really want to go for and present that to, to the board at a later date. Yeah, I was just asking for, to put it into context, um, you know, so we have Beth, I believe your hand was up, and then Mia again. Yeah, I just wanted to say we learned from Andrew that um, equipment budget is Matt Link sort of has jurisdiction over that and facilities, um, you know, more permanent changes to our grounds are through the facilities budget. So I think there is a distinction like Emma brought up, could we get a, you know, lower hanging fruit like the hurdles or the high jump pit? Um, and it seems like that that is those are things that with ten or twenty thousand dollars we could we could do a lot and improve. I mean, right now we're not able to offer the events that compose a track and field team. And you know, thanks to the generosity of other schools, we were able to have a meet. But in terms of kids actually practicing those events, that that can't happen right now on site. So that would be that is something that it, it sounds like it comes from an equipment budget. I don't know if that makes any difference, but. Um, and yeah, they, it's, it's right. decisions Matt makes for the athletic department. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if, and, if there were money that Matt could find, I think that would be great. And I'm sensitive to the fact that we're running 40 minutes over. So on, on this particular topic, though, it's a really important one. Um, so Mia, do you want to just get in one last word on this and, and we'll move forward? Yeah, that's a really good segue. Um, I was going to make a motion to send this to the facilities committee. I don't think we need it, but I'm happy to second it. Okay, because we, we did that, I believe, with the, anyway, I, I think it's helpful for us to make make a formal, like, yeah. movement on this, to, because the students have done a ton of work to, um, to sure. give us the information, and it feels like us, that's us taking it seriously. Sounds good. And Anna, can you confirm that you'll uh, send out a doodle to get us all on the same page? That sounds good. All right, thank you so much. Okay, I, I second that motion. So I'm just gonna go down the list here. Amanda. Yes, but can I just say thank you everybody? Including Anakin. Andrew. Hi. Emma. Hi. Jerry. Hi. Jill. Hi. Kristen. Hi. Mia. Hi. Excited to have this conversation started. Thanks again. And I am an I as well. So we'll refer that to that committee and that committee is going to meet in the next month or so here. Next on the agenda is world language and fine arts um, teachers and an, an additional Point 0.4 FTE in world language and point 0.2 FTE in fine arts. Libby, is this you? Can you provide us with a brief description and ask? Yeah, we have an increase in ninth graders and 10th graders from last year. And um, our fine arts are um, requirements for graduation. And so right now we have too many kids and not enough FTE for our fine arts. Um, so 
the ask is for the board to support us adding point, or I'm sorry, for the world language, point four FTE for the world language um, and point two FTE in the fine arts so that we can accommodate the growing enrollment that's happening at MHS. Right now, our bubbles are moving from MSMS to MHS. And we're, we've also gotten some new enrollments that were quite a surprise. So last year in particular. So we, uh, that's a good problem to have. However, we don't have enough teachers <laughs> for those two areas right now. Can you tell us where that funding is coming from? It come from fund balance. It's a, it's approximately $20,000. Okay. Um, does somebody want to make a motion? Any questions, discussion? Looks like Mia has her hand up, Andrew. Oh, sorry, Mia. Please go ahead. Um, I move to approve, uh, and I do have a question when it's discussion time. Well, why don't why don't you ask why don't you ask the the question now? Um, just to clarify, Libby, it would be fund balance this year, and then just wrapped into the budget as personnel and staffing for the next next fiscal year. Actually, be fund balance for next fixed or for this fiscal year for the budget we've already, we just voted on. Right. Okay. So not the budget we're in, but the budget Correct. we're about to start on July one. Yeah. I'm with and you. Then, and then we'd wrap it into the the budget request for when we start talking about that in December. Yes, you are correct. F FY twenty three. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Does and this won't be for that FY twenty three budget. Um, this is not going to be the only, we're going to need more FTE at, at MHS in a, in a couple different areas, but right now the need is world language and, and uh, fine arts. So just to prep the board for that <laughs> during budget season. That's helpful. Thanks for letting us know that because as we consider fund balance for other initiatives, um, that's something that we need to keep an eye on. Amanda? That's what I was thinking. I, I, I want wondering, I know that we had some allocation like thoughts and conversation around the fund balance that could be used for some of the safety committee recommendations um like a few things i just can't remember what that is so like um i wonder if for the future we could have like a mini report on the fund balance and how we're using it when we're making decisions and being like this is what we had it's in your board packet it's in your packet this time. It's in the quarterly finance report. Okay. Yeah. So if you look at the last page there, um, yeah, let's 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 talk about that. Just because we're so far behind, um, why don't you take? If anybody's interested in this, if you look in the finance report, let me see what the file is called here. Two forty. I see. Yeah. So. We're taking out of that 240. No. Or, oh no, that's fine balance transfer. I can ask those questions later. Um, yeah. I mean, I so, think we need it, but I think, so what I'm ask, requesting is for the future um, because, you know, the financial report, there's a financial committee. So like it gets a little bit yeah. multi-layer decision-making. Um, we don't make this. We don't make decisions on the fund balance in the finance committee. We're just briefed. On, no, but just, we did make prior decisions of some of the, of the allocation when we're talking about the budget. In my remembering, in my remember, in my memory. Um, yeah, we as part as part of the budget, we talk about this and we talk about setting general plans for using fund balance in the into the future, and that's reflected in the finance report. But the mm -hmm. finance committee doesn't doesn't make any decisions on behalf of the board with regard to how to use fund balance. We'd come to the board if if we had a proposal. Mm -hmm. So, um, have we in in the future and in, in heading into budget season, happy to to look at fund balance, talk about fund balance more, and we can set up a time to talk about it too. Um, and Grant would really be one of the best. Would probably be the best person to provide an overview of where we are with that. I just want to clarify, Andrew, just to have clarity on what I'm request what I'm requesting and the clarity that I need is like I I'm being asked to make a decision on a fund balance money that is from prior. So like I want to make sure whatever other commitments like that I want to understand it in my brain that 
whatever other commitments are not being taken away from that, um, even if things are not happening. So that, that's all the requests I'm making for the future. We don't have to have a discussion. I will look to learn more about the Finance Committee and, and, its, and the processes for later. It doesn't have to be right now. I just wanted so, to make that clear. So right now, based on our third quarter financial report, the anticipated unreserved fund balance heading in the next year is $1,060,000. And the proposal is to use about 20,000 of that for this request heading into next year. That's great. And so the other part is how much of that 1 million has, have we already said we were gonna use um, for other things? like the request from the safety committee or other things. So that's just, it doesn't have to happen right now. 20,000 is a drop in the bucket in the millions that we have in that fund balance right now. One million, so. but yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, thank no, you. Mia? I think just uh, what, I, what I'm hearing is that we kind of got a, like, we have like a good timing, a coincidence of timing here where we happen to have the Q3 financial report in our board packet, which has that um, context. Mm -hmm. But in the future, we're, we're anticipating that we will get other requests uh, similar to this one, whether they're personnel or not, where we're saying, yes, we imagine we could use fund balance for this. And it would be helpful when those requests are in our agenda to include the, the most recent financial report possibly, or some way of seeing that context, because that is a lot to hold all in our brains. Sure, sure. Yeah, and, and the unreserved fund balance is around 3 million. And you can see all of the places that it's either obligated to already or that it's planned, like, you know, some, some, some heat pumps at RBS that we, that we talked about previously, teacher bonuses, um, different different things of that nature. So, and it's all itemized there. So page three of the financial report, we can, we can all see it there. So going back to that motion, Mia, do you wanna restate the motion? Yes. I move to approve the increase of 0.4 FTE in world language and 0.2 FTE in fine arts at MHS, utilizing fund balance for FY22. Do I have a second? A second. All right. Uh, Kristen. Hi. Mia. Hi. Amanda. Yes. Anakit. Hi. Jill. Hi. Emma. Hi. Jerry. Hi. All right. And I'm an I as well. All right. So next on our agenda, sorry, I've lost the agenda because I wanted to pull that up to provide that detail. SR2. Thank you, SR2. Libby, is this you? I think it was just more time for the board to ask questions around SR2. All right. Do we have questions? Well, it seems, yeah. go ahead, it seems a little clear that um, to me that the questions were not really helpful in the process. So I thought this was going to be more of like a process around all these communication issues that were happening. And um, so I, I don't feel um, really welcome to ask questions around the answer to one. So one of the questions Mia had last time that didn't get answered was the um, feedback from the Mia, if I get this wrong, correct me, the feedback from the community and what, how did that influence the decisions that were made? Um, so from the, from the community based on their feedback, it, the summer programming was drastically increased. The money to spend on summer programming was drastically increased um, and we made um, commitments to our to our families who can, who are eligible to receive subsidies to pay the rest of that for part two in particular. 
Um, and we also increased the offerings to our community in terms of the sports programming that actually came from our staff who are, fam who are also parents <laughs> and from our community around um, offering that kind of piece. So that was, that was increased drastically. Um, there was a lot from the community around um, making sure that we had enough human resources for our learners, particularly our struggling learners, um, that just further bolstered uh, the administration's decision around the interventionists. Um, so the, those two pieces were um, either bolstered or increased the, the amount we allocated for those pieces. Um, and then of course the community liaison was, was something that was supported by the safety committee as well, prior to asking. So those, those were the main pieces that I didn't have a chance to answer last time with you, for you. And the interventionists, just to refresh my memory from the presentation, those are during the school year, right? Th those are not included in the summer programming. No, they're not included in the summer programming. We, um, we talked as prin the principals and, and administrative, administrative team talked a lot about learning summer programming. And we really felt strongly that we needed to offer fun. <laughs> not, not that uh -huh. learning is not fun, but um, we needed to offer chances for kids to be together and outside and running and playing and all that good stuff. Um, and also, I'm not, I wasn't positive. We didn't try. But my assumption and one of my beliefs is that our teachers need a break. Um, and so I, I mm. was worried that if we asked them to do more, some actually would, and they need a break after this mm. year. So um, there, there are several different pieces to not offering the learning piece of it, or, you know, just actual summer school, um, if you will. Um, there's also uh -huh. very little research that supports summer school as, uh, as something that's effective. So sure what we want, we know that kids running around playing is effective <laughs> in terms of social emotional health and, and just student well-being. Um, so we wanted to really focus on that piece. Um, I see Jerry has her hand up. I have some follow-ups, but I can kick it to Jerry and come back. I've done a lot of talking tonight. Okay. Um, so I listened to your podcast, Libby, uh, I don't know, it was more than a week ago, I guess. Uh, in, and you mentioned that the community liaison position had been um, put into, I think it's called School Spring, the mm -hmm. job area. Um, so I'm wondering about that role. Could you talk a little bit about that role, what they, what they will do? Yep. Or just let me know if I missed it and I need to go read something. Oh, no. Um, so the community liaison role when the job description is to have a very small caseload of kids for our kids who are really struggling with engaging in school. In our district, it's very small. It's a very small group of kids. Um, however, that small group of kids needs a whole lot of support and their families typically need a whole lot of support in terms of connecting with community resources, um, just being there, getting the kids to school, like physically driving to the house and saying, let's go, we're going to school, you know, building really one person to build a really high quality relationship with that family and those kiddos. Um, so that's what we're imagining. We're also imagining after um, uh, Julia, I think Chavez spoke to about um, mentoring services for kids, particularly our LBGTQ plus um, community of kids. That was as soon as you. I read the letter that she um, presented. I was like, "Well, that's a great job for the community liaison to lead as well." So we've we've added some pieces onto it. So really, it's it's that connection to um, to school and community resources for our our families who have the hardest time at it, um, and and kids need to be in school. So of getting kids into school, um, we actually may have some success with our hiring, which I'm we'll be so excited to announce if it all works out. <laughs> but I, uh, we're working on that piece today over a lot. Um, so we, I think we found somebody good, really good. That's great news, thank you. Jerry, hold hand. Any other questions? 
Okay, Emma. So yeah, it felt like um, it felt like there was a misunderstanding, at least on my part, and maybe others at the last meeting. What and and I'll just say like I don't think that it was communicated very clearly to the board what our role was going to be in the ESSER process and uh, decision making process and um, fund you know allocating funds. So, you know, I thought at the last meeting that there was more of an opportunity to sort of like ask questions and um, understand better, you know, why decisions were made. And it did end up feeling like, you know, maybe that wasn't our place, that the decisions have to be made quickly and that the way that these funds are gonna be managed, it's an executive decision by administrators. Um, which is fine. I just want to sort of understand what the role is of the board moving forward. If there's, um, I, I think I heard you say, Libby, in the last presentation that the next round of ESSER funding would require more community input and, and process. And um, I just sort of want to clear the air around like what, you know, I didn't think that any of the decisions of how to allocate funds were bad decisions. I just wanted to sort of understand the process. And I felt like a lot of the questions that were posed um, beforehand in the emails were thoughtful questions that it seemed to me appropriate for the board to be asking. But I, so I guess I just wanna clarify like what the role of the board is in, um, in the process, you know, either now or moving forward. Yeah, I, the, just clarifying questions before when we send out materials and I really appreciate getting the questions before. So if there's numbers we have to find or whatever, I really appreciate those. Um, but then the board, the board member still needs to ask them in the meeting because, because the public can't see the questions, right. Or unless they do a public records request, you know, so even if you ask me them before, I very much appreciate them. I probably am not going to answer you in an email, right. Or I'll say, thank you for the question. And then if you pose it during the meeting, I can be prepared to answer it. So that's just a that's just a process piece, right? In terms of grant, federal grant money, that is considered revenue to the district. It's the same as Title I money or IDEA money. And that's an those are operational decisions as to how to spend those monies. So um, and I believe Jim stated in his email to the board that unless I'm making decisions that go against policy, um, blatantly or go against some blatant value that we have as a community, um, then those are operational decisions for the administration to make. So um, by all means, the board has to understand why we've made them, you know, and, and that's my job to communicate why we've made them. Um, but the board's role is not to, to decide if they are the right decisions or not, um, unless it breaks policy. Mm -hmm. In terms of ESSER 3 that's coming up, Anna and I were actually working very hard on that this morning. Um, the Agency of Education is still trying to understand what the federal guidelines for that are because the feds have put in some extra requirements that have never been put onto federal grant money before. Um, and it's called Meaningful Consultation. So Anna's actually designed a website already that if it's not up on the website, it will be soon-ish around um, that and the Agency of Education Grant and I, Grant Andrew and I were in a meeting this morning at nine with the AOE trying to get clarity as to what it means, um, what meaningful consultation means. And the Agency of Education's definition of that that we just learned this morning is that the administration makes a plan and, the, and is required to go out and get feedback on that plan. So it's not an open-ended, how do you wanna spend this money? This $2.2 million that are coming in it's more of this is the administration's plan. This is why we've decided to make this plan and then offer opportunities to provide feedback. So Anna and I were problem solving this morning as to how we could do that. Um, and how do we intentionally get feedback from certain groups of people in our community? So we're, we're working on that right now and a website is gonna go up very soon or part of a page on our website is gonna go up very soon around SR3 monies. Um, and we were, we have, Anna and I were in conversation today around surveys and around maybe spaghetti dinners and, you know, a couple of things over the summer. The problem is, is that you have to have the meaningful consultation by August. And summer is not traditionally a time that is, that you get, it's, that you get a lot of 
input on <laughs> things over summer, and except for last summer when we were making decisions about how kids were going to come to school. Um, but so it, it does have a challenge when the feds have made the guidelines as July and August to get this information. So we're still working out what that process is. The Agency of Education is still working out what that process is. Um, and so we're taking our guidance from them as we should, because they're the ones who have to answer to the federal government. Thanks, Libby. That's helpful. Emma, do you feel like that answered your question? I think the answer is that our only real role in this is to sort of check it against our policies. And if the spending plan, if we feel that the spending plan is in any way in a violation of one of our policies, that that would be where we have room to ask questions or suggest changes. Yeah, it's hard. I'm kind of bringing in the middle of it. I think a good way to think about our role is we're both kind of like a legislature and a judge. So, you know, the legislature sets out a broad policy, say like the American with Disabilities Act. And then Libby's in charge of executing that, like an administration is in charge of, you know, executing or administering that policy. So say Libby decides that they're going to put in ramps. She could have put in elevators for certain places where there would be stairs. She decides to put it around. She thinks it's the best decision. So we judge that against the policy. So you now the legislature sets a you know a kind of a broad law that would require that some accommodation be made where um, you know where there was there are stairs or a need to go from one level to another. So Libby decides she's going to do ramps. She could have done elevators. We might think elevators would be better. So when the question comes to us, the question is not. The question is like, you know, did she adhere with the policy, which was to make an accommodation? And then we ask, is that accommodation reasonable? And a ramp is reasonable. It, we might think elevators are better. We might think both are better. We might think there's a third solution that's better. But that's not the question we're asking. And we're also not part of the decision-making process with her about whether there should be ramps or elevators. We can ask about her what her decision making process was in terms of what she chose, but we don't make that decision with her. And as long as it's reasonable, we, you know, that's that's kind of the question we ask. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, like Congress sets the Clean Water Act, but the EPA implements it and the EPA does not implement it with Congress. It doesn't invite Congress into the decisions that the EPA makes when it decides to set a policy around implementation of the Clean Water Act. But then a court can come in and decide whether or not that policy the EPA implemented is reasonable. But a, a judge might disagree that whether that's the best policy, but as long as it's reasonable, that's like the extent of her role. So that's so we kind of play those two roles with Libby being like the executive branch. I don't know if that's helpful or confusing. The sort of thing that should have a bigger conversation. I think this is, um, there is a conversation around, you know, how equity is fitted into this relationship, um, how a the work um, gets done in a way that is transparent, that is, um, transparent to our communities who we ultimately are accountable to, right? We are accountable to the community. We're accountable to the parents and we're accountable to those who elected us. That's who we are accountable to. So like just thinking of, I don't think this is a converse. I think, I think we're in a moment of growth for this board. And I think having these conversations piecemeal knowing that we have a really, really big, huge communication issue right now, the way that um, I'm gonna talk for myself, the way that I feel unwelcome, um, the way that I feel that is um, attacked, just like, you know, people may seem that the questioning is a line of question is like, I am here 
to really ask questions around equity, around kids who have been marginalized in this district for a little while, that I want to see those results. And those questions, when we're talking about the impact of my of my questioning, it's not is the impact that is happening in our kids when we don't really like if I am given a decision making authority and all these things on policy, I cannot think of policy if I don't know what's happening. And if I asking questions do not like are are being you know seen as an attack in the administration, we have huge communication issues. I think even having these conversations about board roles and the way that the trainings have been given to us from the school board association, just like being without collaboration, treating us like little kids, treating me, feeling like I'm being treated like a little kid of, you know, being told, stay in your lane since December. You know, I think that there is communication issues that we need to solve as a board if we want to walk together in this path of like really thinking of all the kids in the district. So I don't want to feel every single board meeting that I'm coming here uh, and like asking a question around equity, around what are we doing with the summer kids? Because those are the calls that I get from my community around kids that are not being, whose, whose uh, needs are not being met. And like that I want to brainstorm. If my role is not to support Levy or the administration and thinking about those gaps that don't get to be seen, then if my role is only to rubber stamp, we have had to have bigger conversations about this equity policy and all these other policies that we have in place. So I think I think interpretation of the way, like in the agenda, the next item, the interpretation of the non-compliance of that report is basically a slap in the face. Um, that's the way I see it, like reading that beforehand without having prior communication is a slap in the face that I think that we really should rethink the issue that we have around the way that we treat each other. And I think that is not healthy. It's not, it's a toxic environment. Um, and I think we need to be able to solve that. So I, I missed the last meeting. And so I, I don't know everything that went down though. I, I, I saw the messages and, and I, I do feel like there has been a tense situation for a while on, on the board. And I think part of it from my perspective is that some of these questions don't come across as questions so much as sometimes they come across as expectations and accusations. And I think that's where quite a bit of friction comes from, from my perspective. That's, that's where I feel like I'm seeing some friction come from. And I, I, hear, I hear what you're saying, Amanda, but I also, you know, you, I feel like people do listen to you. I feel like you, you do have a lot, of, a, a, a lot of floor time, which is great. I mean, you're a board member, you should have it. I don't feel like you're being silenced. I feel like you're able to communicate and voice your perspectives. I appreciate you being on the board. Um, I do think we are bound by some laws that you don't like. And I, I've i seen you become frustrated by that. And I find it frustrating too sometimes. Um, so I do feel like as, as a board, we do have lanes that we need to stay in. I mean, we're a board of a school district and we don't, I don't think we want to hamper and I, I, I don't think we want, I think our administration has done a really good job on a lot of fronts. So to the extent that we can set visions and expectations and, and then work with our superintendent to meet those visions and expectations, to me, I feel like that's really our place. And sometimes I, I don't think there's any problem with questioning down down to the detail level, but sometimes it doesn't feel like questions. Like, although I wasn't at last meeting, when I saw Jill's email, I, I could imagine where it was coming from. So I'm just, I'm just articulating my perspective on this. I, yeah, I'm I, also gonna, 
Yes, yeah, I wasn't being honest too. I mean, yeah, there has been several people have requested that there be more clarity around roles and responsibilities. And when someone like the DSBA is brought in, I mean, they understand, I mean, you might not love them, but they understand the rules, they understand the roles, they understand the laws. Um, who else is really better qualified to at least give some perspective on that? And I feel every time that there's a discussion about roles and responsibilities, and even when like, frankly, some, some clear legal obligations are communicated, the response back is I'm talked down to, I don't agree with that, we're redefining ourselves. So it's very hard to have any conversation just conveying basic information without a pushback. So there's this kind of like, tell me what my role is. Okay, this is, this is, this is the role, this is the role as, as it's understood. These are some of the legal obligations. Well, I don't like that. I mean, and that's a very tough place to work from. I mean, and everyone signed up for this role. There's other roles you can play. You can be in the legislature, you can be a parent, you can be a parent advocate. This is a particular role and it has particular roles and it has particular responsibilities, um, none of which were created by anyone on this board. And we can certainly have, you know, there is some room to play within that role. Um, but if we don't like the role, it's, it's the role we signed up for. There's a bunch of hands that have been up for a while. I'm hoping. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Mia? Um, I have a few thoughts slash questions, I think related to ESSER, but it feels like maybe this is a valuable piece of context or not, but I, I'm really leaning into something Amanda said about this being a growth moment for the board. And, um, and I don't necessarily mean like, well, we have a whole bunch of new board members and so things have to change. What I'm talking about is we as a board, and this was even before I joined, committed to working to make our district a more equitable place. Um, we have an equity policy and the growth that I'm talking about happening right now is that we're at a point where we're reaching the, the, some of the more difficult decisions that have to be made um, in order for that to happen um, and decisions about everything from how we communicate with each other to how we, how we do collaborate at the, the way that I put it. So Libby, when we got a chance to talk last week was like at the edges of our roles with all of us still, still being in our roles to the decisions that we make to allocate resources. And, um, for those of us who've heard the fabulous podcast that Libby did with Hannah Barden and Ashley Dubois around equity, Hannah put it really beautifully that when we have conversations about equity that are about our own learning and growth, it all feels really good. But when it comes time to have to make tough decisions about how we allocate resources, it's actually really challenging. And we're in a moment that may last for a long time that is challenging for all of us. And I think that might be where some of that discomfort is, is coming from. Um, and so I just wanted to share that as a piece of context for this broader, broader conversation that we're having of which I see the ESSER funds as really just one component of it. And certainly a big one because it's a probably once in a generation opportunity of funds coming in from the federal government that we can see there are myriad ideas of how to use this money. And um, I think we all really want to be true to, to, to having, to, to serving our community in, in the decisions that are made around this money. And um, so that's why I feel like this is one example of a place where it is very difficult to take any of the lessons that we've internalized around equity and actually put them into practice. Um, and and it, it's messy and hard and, and terrible and in the end, really, really worth it 
to, to work through it together. Uh, so that's the, the piece of context that I wanted to share around where I, why I feel like this tension is coming up in, in this moment and what, you know, how we all can really sit with it as, as individuals and as members of this collective body. Um, I don't know, Jerry, if you wanted to speak to this or if I yeah. can shift to the ESSER so, questions that I have. I, I, want, I kind of want to speak to all of it because I did, I had to leave early last time, but I did watch the, the video and I guess I don't really understand um, what the issue is because if you attended the ESSER community engagement meeting, if you listened to the podcast, if you read Libby's emails um, starting on March 26, asking us to um, join the community, being telling us what she was planning, what she was going to do. I think the process was relatively straightforward. If you attended those and read the materials and looked on the website and and even, uh, you know, about the library books. I know Libby had mentioned it before. She mentioned it again to, tonight in our finance committee meeting about um, looking at all the library books and making sure that we are being, um, we are representing um, what we want to represent through our books, through our classrooms, through our academics. So I think it's, to me, at least it's, it's, I feel like the administration is, is 100% committed and are basing the, the financial decisions on equity, diversity, inclusion. Um, so I guess I'm just not clear what, what is missing. And the one thing I will say is when I watched the video, it, it did feel like within the questions were accusations and that's not that that's not a good way to ask a question um you know we have to we have to assume the best about each other we have to assume good intentions and that's why i, I assume you know it was just <laughs> it was just it was not intentional but the questions did come across in a in an ac accusatory way so um, that's my perspective. I don't, I, I, I keep feeling like I'm missing something because when I read the materials, look at, you know, everything that's available, the information is out there. Amanda? Oh, no, I'm waiting for everybody to. That was my old hand. I mean, a, a general question that that I have, Mia, based based on what you said before, is can you kind of paint, a, or Amanda, can you paint a picture of what equity looks like in this case? Because I did miss last meeting, um, though. I mean, I I understand where this conversation is stemming from. I've been on the board. It's not like just missing one meeting. I'm missing the whole picture. But can we, like, what? In in this case, let's use let's use the ESSER funding. Can you can you paint a picture of what equity looks like here? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, for me, it's like a needs assessment of um, the kids who are needing things right now. So, like um, for example, kids with IEP have been actually advocating for a couple of years now to have remedial programs through the summer. Um, I have uh, programs through the summer. They already have them. It's not, yes, okay, I'm going to explain a little bit about what that looks like for my son who has an IEP um, in the summer. I have to take him to school. He has to have a speech therapy. Um, he, I have to drive from the preschool to the high school. This was before COVID um, to get his 30 minutes of speech therapy assigned um, from a different from a private instructor because our lovely speech therapy takes the summer off, which was just great. And I appreciate. And um, and then, you know, 
he gets to know his speech therapy for like the first 20 minutes. He's like, who is this person? So he literally gets 10 minutes of speech therapy. Then I have to drive him back to the preschool, which is an Eastbound pillar. I have a very flexible schedule. Uh, so does my husband's is really great. But for a parent who is a single mom um, who has to have a full-time job, that is really difficult. Right. It's it, it's so it's like thinking outside the box around equity. It's like if we have kids who are taking their private tutoring classes because they are behind in literacy, for example, we do have um, now all of our grades, now all of our students are proficient in some of the literacy. Um, so like thinking ab about that, so like e equity is like, and I've seen many districts, you know, like Essex, uh, Burlington, Winooski all have like summer programs that are like a little bit of that remedial piece of it. So it's, it's not something that's just like out of the ordinary of, of this venue. Um, and like, so like for me, like thinking around equity, I think what the feelings that I had was that we had about what, maybe two and a half days to be able to look at the reports before the presentation. And, and so like that literacy report that was in there and that is there is there funding report that we never really got a chance to look at. That was a conversation from a couple of months ago. So in, in, in equity, like it's not only data driven, but it's a needs assessment of what the families are going through right now. We heard from Julie about mental health. We, we, we held, so, you know, my question was, how was the mental health support included in the social emotional learning? Those are, you know, questions that were based on needs and conversations that have happened in this board and from other families that have come. So um, I just spoke with a family yesterday that was talking about this remedial program. I was like, oh, I can actually relate. And um, the relation around this equity piece, why it's important is because I have a really great health insurance because I work for the state. And my and I, every summer, like for this year, I was able to put in his IEP that I was not gonna take any services because he was gonna get them outside from like his occupational therapy and physical therapy out of the very, which I can make appointments at 5.30 in the afternoon for him um, so that he doesn't lose what his work that he's been doing. Um, so I think like for that, I have privilege. I have health insurance, that's really good. I have a really good family doctor for him. I have a husband that has very flexible schedules as well as mine. So I think like that, so when, when I'm thinking of that report, I'm thinking of those families and that was the question I was, what is the remedial program? I also have a few neighbors who are teachers who do this every year, this um, tutoring for kids who don't wanna get behind in the summer. So it's like, okay, how are we placing those kids? And then again, equity, we were thinking about the summer program. I was concerned. My daughter, my own daughter is in a mountain biking with Tristan at the elementary school. I'm paying for it. But then we like the poor thing couldn't make it because her bike is so old. Like, and Tristan's like, well, we need to get her a little a better bike because, you know, that bike is too hard for her because it was a hand-me-down. So I'm like, oh my God, how much are mountain biking? They're expensive. I got another hand me down from somebody else, but it's like, if we have a summer program that requires this mountain biking, they're expensive. It's like, it's not like we're giving them and it's not for everybody. So those are my equity questions. It's like, when we have this extra funding, are we looking at free and reduced lunch and like how we really impact those families, if it's just like not to give, but also like those who are behind, um, not necessarily COVID because the report said that we weren't behind. Okay, but there are there have been disparities before. So, but if we don't have those data in the board, um, at least not for the past six months, I have not seen any of that. So it's, it's, it's so that that is the question and that is the experience that I, um, hearing from families and like my own experience actually around around those pieces of questions that I had. Um, the SR3, you know, there is a lot of conversation that like, what is the needs assessment? Um, that is not just the 
based on the continuous improvement plan. Yeah, that's great, but there's an influx of money. Can we really look at that data and look at our kids with disabilities, how they're doing, you know? Like, I think there is uh, creativity to support some of our kids. Thank you. Um, I don't know, so, Mia, Libby. Yeah, so, so Amanda, I think, painted a really great picture of sort of like what equity would look like in the spending of the money. And um, I have some thoughts on what equity would look like through the process. So one of the questions that I posed in for the last meeting was what work the district or the, the administration had done to bring in input from families who don't normally speak up. Um, and how how were those how were those perspectives considered in the process? And that's an that is rooted in the policy that we have, the equity policy that we have to to I have it in front of me to counteract the present and historical impact of bias, prejudice, and discrimination that for generations across our nation has blocked access to truly truly equitable educational opportunities for all students. And that's extra work. It takes extra work to do that. Um, and so I was asking how that extra work had been worked into the, the decision-making process that the, that the district um, un underwent um, to make the decisions around the ESSER II funding. So that's just one example of how equity is worked into the decision-making process, just to help answer your question, Andrew, about painting that picture. And the other is, you know, I've, I've heard from three board members now about how the questions land more as accusations. And I think a way that equity works itself into the process is that when somebody hears a question as an accusation, they look internally and they go, why does that feel like an accusation to me? How is that challenging this position of comfort and un, in, in, in my perspective? It's a challenge. And- Yeah, I'm gonna have to disagree with you because the specific example I'm thinking of is when Amanda asked, how will the community liaison officer be chosen? Will it just be someone you know? That has nothing to do with me. And, and just that's an clarify, accusation. That that's an accusation. Clarify, and Jerry, and Libby said she posted it per our yeah, usual Jerry, process. I want to clarify because that's actually not factual. What I asked was hiring the contractors, uh, like the consultant firms, very different than from the community liaison position. It's like how, when we hire contractors, do we have RFPs? for some of the cons equity consulting work that is being done. And um, that's different than the community liaison question that I asked, which was where was it posted because I never saw it because I would have loved to send it to other people that I and knew. Was, and, and it was I, I never part of it the, the meeting because it was hard for me to find. I did not see it. That, that's just me, I did not see it. So, but, so it, it's not factual. Um, that I never asked, I said, with the consultants, are they RFPs? And yes. No, that but you did say, point. are they just people you know? We have it. You can look at the video. Yeah, exactly. The it's, consultant it's, it's firms, accusatory. are they just people you know? Correct. So that's a question. So that has nothing to do with me. I just want to make it clear. That's nothing internal. Okay. It's just, it, it's asking a question that's also accusing at the same time. Of I get them or something like that. I understand the clarification, Jerry. Thank you. I guess what I'm trying to do in answering Andrew's question is bring in some of the training and learning that we've had from the sessions that we've had with Mara that where she, I think, has done a really great job asking us to, to, to get uncomfortable with with working through these things. And, and that feels to me like what 
equity looks like in this process is that those of us who hold a lot of comfort and privilege, when we feel something like, oh, wow, that feels off to me or wrong or, or weird, we, we, we stop and, and rather than pushing out, we look internally. I'm not as good at this as Mara is, but I do want to, I'm, I'm challenging all of us, myself included, to use those moments as learning moments, as well as being, you know, in order to help us all grow as, as we do this work together. I do appreciate the clarification, Jerry, but I wanted to also bring it up to a bigger picture of what equity looks like through this process. Emma? I feel like, you know, we probably need to set aside time to work on to sort of address some of the underlying communication issues. And I don't know what the appropriate, you know, place or how to do that is. It does feel like we should dedicate time outside of this meeting to do that. Because when I look around at all of the faces here tonight, I see incredibly dedicated, intelligent, caring people that just want to help their schools become better places. And everybody here has incredibly busy lives outside of these meetings. And you all come and you all give your heart and soul to this role and you stay late for every meeting, Jim. <laughs> and, um, you know, we all want what's best for the kids and what's best for the schools. So for me, it feels like it should be something that is that there can be a resolution to because it it does. Um, you know, it hurts, it stings to hear Amanda say that she doesn't feel welcome or safe at uh, asking certain questions. And that feels like something that needs to be addressed and taken seriously and not just sort of like, well, you signed up for this role, so that's what comes with it. Like, I don't want to be dismissive of feelings. And same with Jerry's concern about watching back and what Jill brought up. Like, I take those concerns to heart, watching back, you know, tape of the video of the meetings and saying, there's a trend here. Let's look at that trend. Let's see what is behind it. And um, you know, what does this mean for our communication moving forward? Because I don't think that anyone on this board does not, in fact, I, I feel like I know for a fact that everybody really supports Libby and the administration and is very supportive of the schools and just wants to see the schools become the best places that they can be for the kids. So nobody has, you know, some sort of hidden agenda here that is anything other than that. So I just feel like, you know, it's sort of simple slash intense um, communication issues that need to be resolved. But I don't see why we wouldn't be able to resolve them looking at all of the faces in front of me. You know, I think we can do this and I think we should try but I don't think it's gonna happen in the next 10 minutes. And that's one of the issues that I felt at the last meeting was like this sort of rush to be like, and, and there was some misunderstandings and, you know, Jerry, my, my thing was, and maybe I will be the first to admit that I am very, very busy and don't always listen to the podcasts in a timely manner and don't always read to the fourth page of a financial packet um, in the board packet. So I'm not gonna, pretend like I had all the time in the world to do all of the homework necessary to be the best board member that I could be the other night. But, um, but my question was more around just simple like board, where does our, where is our role? Because just tell me if the role is not to ask questions and the role is just to, you know, listen to the presentation and, and, you know, accept it for what it is. Then, then that just needs to be, I just feel like that could have been explained um, prior to the meeting the other night. And maybe it was in some email and I just missed it. Um, anyway, I, so I guess I would, I would suggest that we carve out time. And I know we did a little bit of that at the retreat, but um, to address some of these feelings and communication missteps, um, because I think that they can be resolved. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump in here. 
I am when I talk about roles and when I harp on roles, I am not trying to quell debate at all. And I'm certainly not trying to quell the the type of of questions, oversight questions that I think you know Mia and Amanda and, and others are interested in. But knowing our role and knowing both the limitations, but also the responsibilities of that role. And when I say we signed up for it, we did sign up for it. We signed up for a specific role which has specific responsibilities, which give us actually a lot of power to shape the district. I mean, the equity policy you're all pointing to was the product of work that this board did with people that understood their roles. And it's a very effective policy. And now our role is oversight. Our, our role is to ask the type of questions that Mia was talking about, about you know, how did equity, you know, at what you know, points did it enter the decision-making process? You know, what was the process like? What did you do? Um, how did you reach out to the community? Um, but our role is, is to ask those questions from a point of gathering information and then exercising oversight. So, you know, if, if, if we're talking about a certain program that we might feel is deficient, I think our first question should be Libby to like explain, you know, what are we doing in mental health? Can you explain, you know, what are the mental health services that the district has? You know, what are we doing now? You know what went into that, and I think a lot of conversations start with we need more mental health. We're not doing enough, and not starting at those initial question points and figuring out you know what's the work that's gone into it, what's the decision that's gone there, and then having the conversation go from there. And I think that's when people are talking about they seem more accusatory than inquisitive. That's I think where that's coming from. I don't think it has anything to do with not wanting to ask tough questions and not wanting to delve into tough issues. I mean, the reason that the board put forth a very progressive equity policy is because we did want to delve into these questions and we did want to explore these, but we have to do it from our role. And that means understanding our role, including the parts of our role that we don't like. And, and the more we understand our role, frankly, the more effective we're going to become because we're not going to have discussions like this where we chew up board meeting after board meeting you know, bickering with each other about, you know, what our roles are, but instead acting effectively within our roles to get the information we need from Libby to exercise oversight and push change. And that is and, exactly and we're going to we're going to spin wheels. We that's exactly why at the beginning I said that we can't have these conversations that there is a communication issue. I've been in this board six months. And every month I've had, I had a problem. I asked Jim for that I would like to actually engage in a restorative circle with Libby, since the district is really engaging into restorative justice, because I think it is a communication issue. So every month I come charged with the toxicity that he has felt. So you cannot tell me how I feel because this is how I feel, right? Not like you don't see it, but I feel it. And that's important. There's a, there's a cultural uh, dynamic also happening around the tone police and around the way I talk, the way that I move my hands um, and the way that I ask questions. Um, and so that is, you know, things to consider and to think about. I think it's really important that, um, that we, so what I'm asking right now is that I think that we need to engage in a, whether it's, uh, like a restorative circle around like, what are the communication issues that no, I don't think any of us here has the capacity or skills to facilitate something that what I'm asking for. And I think that if we want to like move this board, I am here for this role. I got elected, I signed up for it. My commitment to this district has been shown. I've been here for four years, working really, really hard for all of our family. So like, in all the hats that I wear in this district with the families that I work with, it's like, it's, it's, it's not, I'm not here to be a politician. I have no aspirations to become a legislator ever. This is, I am in this role because I believe in public education and I believe in, in working collectively to make this better. So I think that what I'm asking is like, let's make this happen. Let's make this work. Let's collaborate. We could be like Essex, you know, like I feel like we're in the parallel world. We have a racist one over there. And then we have me here trying to like fight to just be listened to in a way that dignifies um, our co our collaboration. So um, I, I, I think that, you know, I understand my role and I want to understand my role more 
but understanding role doesn't mean that you, you know, like, I, I understand procedures and I understand politics and I understand like what's happening right now. <laughs> and I think that there is a way to move forward that um, he warrants more caring for each other um, and more building community with each other. And if that's not what you want, that's fine, but that's what I'm asking. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you, Amanda. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Mia. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, Jerry. Appreciate, appreciate this personally. Um, I do wanna move forward with this meeting. I don't wanna just leave this. I think we can all agree that we need some more facilitation to work through some things. I think we made progress with Nathan previously. So um, Jim, what, what, do you, what do you think about, um, you know, we could do another, another retreat where we just focus solely on communication um, at some point in the next several months. Yeah, I mean, I, I would be good with that. I'm definitely open to suggestions. I mean, we need something to get, you know, I think unstuck. Um, I mean, it'd be great if we could find someone who could, I think, bring some restorative practices, but also, you know, help with, with, with board roles too. And I mean, I, I do think that we're struggling to, to figure out a way to operate within the board role effectively. Um, with some complicated issues that are that are going on. I mean, we, yeah, we we can only redefine it to a certain point, and I think that is that is an issue. Okay. All right. Client survey. I don't know who put this on, so. Um, Libby, did you put this on here, or Mia, did you ask for it to be on here? Well, the board should have some discussion if that's the climate, if that's the survey that need, that they want to bring to the team. You have one week, so you're running out of time here to decide on whether or not this is the survey that you want to go out to, to teachers. And, and I, I sent Mia and Amanda some questions personally on this. I don't know if you've had time to read them yet um, or consider them. I don't know if anybody else has responded. Yeah, we got, we got feedback from you and Jerry. I thought the process that we were following is that we would get feedback from board members individually and then incorporate what we heard. And then Andrew would send it to the teacher negotiation team. So I, I definitely hear you, Libby, we are running out of time. Um, but that was what I was thinking the next step would be is Amanda and I spoke this morning, incorporated the feedback and we're getting it to Andrew. I am gonna venture to bet that with continuing that process, you have run out of time because the teacher negotiation team would need to read it. They'd need to meet and there's one week left. I don't think you have time for that process. You can try. Um, but I don't think you have time for it to get the data that you want. Yeah, and I, I don't think that based based on conversations with teachers that I've had recently, just where their heads are at in our district and other districts, I'm not certain that any of that, I'm not certain that this is going to be met with uh, open arms from our teachers as, oh yeah, we wanna, we wanna deal with yet another thing right now at this point in the year. Um, that's just, but I, do th I don't think it hurts to engage with them heading into next year for a survey. I personally don't think that survey is quite at the place it needs to be. Um, yeah, and we need to, 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 to uh, as, as, sorry. Annika, go ahead. No, I was just, I was just going to ask, um, don't we need, uh, as in the policies and procedures, don't we need to provide them with the survey? So in the negotiated agreement. In the negotiated agreement, yeah, yeah. Don't we need to provide them a survey? 
I mean, if we talk with them, if we engage with them about, hey, we're, this is where we are. Frankly, I could just reach out to to Chris and, and and Chris is leaving, of course, Chris and Joe and say, hey, we're trying to flesh this out as a board. We want a meaningful survey. How do you feel about us, you know, issuing something in the fall rather than trying to cram it in at the end of the school year? I'm willing to bet that that will be well received, but I'm not certain. My do we need to do it in, uh, another amendment to the agreement to say this to, to have a piece of paper, or are we just no? There's no, there's no real teeth to that, from what I can tell. If both parties are okay with it. Yeah, you, you have to have a conversation with them about it. Yeah. Um, you shouldn't just ask them. Yeah. And then say, what do you think? And well, I think the way it's worded right now, it might, like, I think that preamble is going to be confusing um, the way it's it's written right now. I, I personally, what I was thinking back in April when we began discussing this was that I'd have like, you know, five to 10 uh, demographic space questions, then maybe would would have some the rest of the survey ready, maybe not. And I could take that and say, hey, you know, here here are the questions that we'd like to ask. Here's why we'd like to ask them. Here's why we think it would be beneficial to the district. We want to engage in a back and forth with you about, about including this in the survey. Um, I mean, I could essentially take those demographics questions you've you've drawn up, put them in a document, send it to them and just explain where we are right now with everything. And I can, I can incorporate, you know, some of, I can reference the equity policy um, and some of the, you guys have given me several past statements and, and I we can- We already worked on that this morning, Andrew. So I'll send you the updated one, which has the draft. And then it has, we moved the, demographic data to the bottom um, and then took in uh, Jerry's um, recommendations. Can I ask another question, timing related? Yeah. Um, if, if, let's say if we send it as is right now um, to them, they would need some time to meet and then vote on it or approve it or whatnot, right? And then the survey goes out and the teachers need some time to respond to that, right? Yeah. All of this needs to happen before 13th? 14th is a Monday. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I'm asking what's 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 the dead, drop dead deadline where all of this needs to happen before? I, I, right now, if it's still in the form that I saw, when you send yes, it let's, let's assume that it's 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 complete and then at the end of this meeting we send it out right so and it's, it's, so it's very long it. and and you probably won't get many res as many responses as you want because of the length of it unless teachers are given time during the day to fill it out and yeah and what's that out. date i guess that's that was my question what's the date that they need to that that we think that they they will they will have I think you'd, you'd want to get it in their hands by, by Friday this week. Friday this week. The, right? thing, the thing is that doesn't allow for any kind of back and forth with the teachers about these that, types yeah. of questions that we had heard the union was not super fond of. So my general thought, my proposal would be reach out to the teachers this week, explain the situation, share the... You know, if we have a draft survey, if you guys can get that to me tomorrow morning, I can do this tomorrow evening. I'm going to be out of cell service by like 5 p.m. on Friday. So, um, Andrew, I, in my last union leadership meeting, I meet with them monthly. Um, the last one I had was last Tuesday, I think. And uh, we've come to an agreement around the demographic data. So the district will be asking those questions in the beginning of the year next year um, as part of our mandatory um, reporting things that we have to do anyway in the beginning of the year. So we will be gathering that information. We were able to clear up that problem, that challenge together. Um, so 
just so you know, that's, I don't think that's the issue with this survey. I think it's the length. And I think it's, it's, it's a survey that is, that should be created together, I think, and should be the same each year so that we get some really good information off of it each year. It's valuable um, about where our teachers are, are feeling. And so um, I think if you send anything to them right now, it's short and sweet. I mean, do we want to see if they're amenable to us? I mean, obviously we get the information for this year, but if we want something longer and more complicated, I think we're running out of time. So an, another option here, I just want to throw it out, is we could explain that we've been working on a draft survey that we'd like to work on with them, would like to propose it to them, get their feedback from, on, you know, and we could set that conversation up for next school year. Um, we've done a lot of the work already and we could get something out short and sweet. I don't know what it would be before the end of the school year. Um, or we can, or we could simply ask them. You could just ask them, is, is this something you want to do this year? And if yeah. so, what are the highlights you want? And, and just write it real quick and send it to them. It's not gonna be perfect. Yeah. Uh, Chris and Chris and Joe and the and, and uh, um, Carolyn and the others on the leadership team, Rebecca, Sarah Halpine, they'll be able to answer you real quick. And you have the relationship with Chris and Joe, so just go there first. So you, you think instead of just sending them this this long survey draft survey right now, just explain the situation and, and tee it up for next year? Yeah, and um, you can pose it to them. You can say we have a draft of a pretty long survey to send you, um, and we're happy to do that. Or um, if, if you'd like to propose something else, or you'd like us to just send something really short and sweet, or if you'd like, to, we'd really like to work on this with you for next year, if we could put it off another year, um, what would you like to do? Put it, give them the opportunity to give you feedback on that. If I know anything about our teachers, they're very good at giving feedback. Me and Amanda, um, um, how, do, how does that sound to you? Um, sorry, I had to step away uh, for a second, but I think the gist is that we'd send them a request to Ask see how they want to proceed. Yeah. Um, I would really like to lean into the working out a strong survey with them in order uh, over a, hey, we could pull together something short and sweet and send it next week. Cause I don't, I don't wanna go backwards. Um, I definitely hear that the what's there is long. It, we intended to whittle it down with the teachers, um, but I don't wanna just like, grab something and send it to them for the sake of sending it to them because I'd like to use use something that will give us the information that we're looking for. Um, my hunch, Mia, and, is that the teachers will agree with you. That would to, be my to, hunch. To, to work I don't on wanna, it. Yeah, I don't want to speak for them. But that, that's what I would, I would bet they want to do, but I don't want to speak for them either. But it is yeah. contractual, so you should talk to them. Oh, I agree. I agree that we should talk to them. I guess what I would say is let's lead with our preference would be to work with you and tee this up for next year rather than like offering it as like, oh, it doesn't really matter to us. We could do either of these things when we, when we um, reach out to them. Yeah. And I don't think, I don't think it's an either, or I think the suggestion would be, you know, we've been working on this survey. We realize we're running out of time. We, we want this to be a back and forth. We realize we don't have enough time left in this year. So definitely tee up that conversation for next year. And then the question to them is, do, do we want to proceed with something short and sweet this year? Or do we want to agree that, you know, we're going to come to the table and, and develop something collaboratively that's meaningful next year that we'll be able to use year over year kind of thing. Does that sound like a plan? 
Yeah, I guess I would just lean farther away than the way you just phrased it in the, do we want to proceed to something short and sweet? Because I don't think we can pull off short and sweet right now. What if they really want something? We did promise them. Something. And we can send them the survey that we that we did use before. Can we just send them what we have and say, here are the, th the thoughts. This is very long, but you know. I don't think that's fair to them to expect them to respond within the last two weeks of a really- No, I'm not as asking you for them to see what we have and, and like ask the same conversations. I, I mean, I think that's, I, okay. This is I, a little bit of semantics around like what conversations we have. It's like, okay, so I, if they want something short and sweet, we can. I'm gonna, I'll, yeah. I'll reach out. I'll maybe, reach out. Uh, survey from last year. <laughs> like that, if, if, if it's required, then, you know, like if what they want is something now, we can just copy and do the one from last year. Okay, all right. Yeah, I'll reach out to them after this, after this meeting. Okay, next item on the agenda. Sorry, I dropped it again is equity committee update. Yeah, so um, I'm sorry, I meant to send a email to help kind of point everybody in the, in the uh, not right direction, but what the update is. It, it is in the minutes from the May 11th, I think. The, the minutes of the most recent equity committee that was in our board packet. We have uh, drafted a charge and put together a very rough timeline for how we expect to go about setting some goals. Um, and we just wanted to share that with all of you and get any input from you on both of those things. Um, what, how the charge looks to you, if this is kind of what you all would have imagined the, the equity committee charge um, looking like and uh, see if you have any questions on the timeline or that kind of stuff. Um, so that was, that was the main purpose um, of this update. And then also um, wanted to toss out the, the sort of question or request to the board. We imagine that um, part of this timeline to help us determine what our goals ought to be will include getting community input through a survey. And we wanted to see if we could use um, some of the budget that the board has uh, to translate the survey to provide to make it more accessible to um, to our uh, non uh, um, people who are who don't naturally speak or who, for whom English is not their first language. So that's the update slash questions for all of you. So wait, was this, are you gonna be providing the charge to everybody or have you already provided that? Because I didn't see that, oh, maybe I The charge that. is in the minutes of the equity committee from um, the minutes that were included in our board packet. At least I think there were minutes included in our board packet. I didn't see them. They might be on the website somewhere. I just saw the agenda. You, you're right. I think we should move this to next meeting's agenda. <laughs> Since you all haven't had a chance to see the draft charge. Sounds good. I yeah. apologize for that. I should have double checked. Yeah, if you just want to send it out to everybody too. I think that would work. Well. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Mia. Okay. Policy monitoring. Do we want to? We had a little bit of discussion about this just before. Do we? Do we want to have more discussion about the policy monitoring reports? I mean, we could push it off to the next meeting too. It's nine o'clock. 
It is light. I mean, especially if you want to, you know, it sounds like there were some concerns that we might want to have some discussion around. And I'm not sure 902 is the, the time to. I think, I think that's a good suggestion. We don't need a motion for that, do we? To no, I think we can just disable it. Oh. Okay. All right. All right. It's nine o'clock. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Are we forgetting anything? Sorry, my dog is having a dream. <laughs> is he moving to adjourn? It's not like it. <laughs> I move to adjourn. Second. Oh, all right. Um, Emma. Hi. Amanda. Hi. Anakit. Hi. Jill. Hi. Jerry. Hi. Kristen. Hi. Mia. Hi. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you.